one interview. But Phil, your guest and your interview certainly warrant it. Fawn, former Chicago Symphony Orchestra principal trumpet Adolph Bud Herseth, is a remarkable musician by any measure. He anchored the orchestra's fabled brass section for more than 50 years, and he's just retired. Here's Bud Herseth performing at his 50th anniversary concert at Orchestra Hall. This was back in 1998. Joined by the man behind the trumpet, Adolf Butthurst. Welcome. Thank you. And it's delighted to be here. And congratulations. You know, Thank the you. fact that you were principal trumpet of an orchestra like the CSO more than 50 years, some people say that will never happen again. What goes through your mind when you, when you, think, of, when you think of your longevity in that high profile, high musically demanding position? Well, first of all, I always felt that I was lucky to even get there. That was not my plan. I went to New England Conservatory of Music after World War II on that government issue Bill of Rights, GI Bill of Rights, where they paid your tuition and you could go if you were three and a half years in the service, which I was, you got four and a half years of tuition and living expense. Well, I wanted to get a master's degree and be a teacher. And all of a sudden I found out I was to go and play an audition for what I thought was third trumpet in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And when I played the first audition for Arthur Rodzinski, he said, you will be the new principal trumpet. I didn't had no idea it was auditioning for first trumpet. How old were you at that time? That would have been in the fall of 1947, because I joined the orchestra in the summer of 48 at Ravinia. So at that point, I was uh, 26 years old. 26 years old, and you're, yeah. you're, you're uh, knighted first trumpet, principal trumpet of the CSO. Yeah. And um, some people say that over the years that you were at the CSO, that in certain respects, in many respects, you defined the sound of the CSO. Did you ever, did you ever see mm -hmm. your, yourself that no, way? No, I don't think that's ever anybody's particular intention. Uh, actually... My experience in playing with that orchestra, I, I can describe it to you very well. I learned so much from my colleagues, especially my colleagues, and of course from various conductors, and having heard the Boston Symphony play uh, every week for uh, two years that I was at the conservatory, I had a good idea in mind of how this music is supposed to go. And I would listened to my colleagues, and I tried to fit in with what they were doing, and I learned the learning issue never stops, of course. And I was lucky to be there that long. I'm lucky to still be around. What are you going to say? Some people say that the um, New York Times, for example, once said of you that you were arguably the best musician in an orchestra in any of, of, of any instrument. Uh, you uh, achieve this level of you achieve this level of visibility in the orchestral world. Uh, but your roots, you started out. Uh, you came from a musical family. Right. T tell me about your, your early years. Well, all of us in the family where I, where I was brought up, we were given piano lessons and encouraged to try different instruments. But look at you. you, you how old are you there with a trumpet in your hand? Oh, my goodness. And there you are in high school. And that's my dear at, wife, Avis. At, at your left. And your wife was, uh, yeah. was, was, was the blonde. Right. And here you are. After I won the first prize. National Trumpet Competition. Was this in high school? Yeah. Junior in high school. Your dad? Your dad. Yeah. Tell me about him and, and what well, he Well, my dad was, uh, actually, he was a school teacher and a school superintendent and also band director. And actually, my first musical experience, I was in the second grade in a little town in South Dakota. We lived there one year before moving to the big town, Bertha. Big Bertha. Big Bertha. That's, I, that's what I always said. That's where they got the name for those golf clubs, you know. But anyway, in the summer, in many of those little towns, maybe this still goes on, they'd have a bandstand that they would erect down in the middle of the main street for Saturday night concerts over the summer. 
And, you know, all the old-time guys who would play instruments when they were kids, they practice up a little bit, and high school kids and grade school kids, you just go ahead and play a little band concert, my dad would conduct. And he had, I had just had a trumpet for uh, three or four months, and it was from Sears Roebuck, by the way, what they used to call a silver tone trumpet, $20. Wow. Ooh. That was real money back then. Yes, it was. So he said, you, you got to come. Come on. Come, come sit in the band tonight. Are you kidding? I can remember climbing up the steps to go and sit in the far end of the cornet trumpet section. And I still remember the unbelievable experience of being surrounded and soaked up in collective music like that. I think that's where my whole idea started. Let's listen to another clip of you and yeah. another clip from the Haydn. And sure. after we hear this clip, I want to talk to you about your tone. Because okay. that's something that, uh, <clears throat> that a lot of people talk about. Let's, let's listen. You've said that your playing was heavily influenced by singers. What do you mean? Like, you specifically mentioned Frank Sinatra, Maria Callas. Yes. How, do, how, how does that work? Well, when we were young kids growing up in our family, in the days of the old 78 recordings, 10 inch or 12 inch, some of the real old ones had stuff only on one side of the record, by the way. My dad had some opera excerpts. And I would listen to those, and I thought, wow, you know? And then I began to hear these good singers on the radio and then especially TV when I was first starting to come in, black and white. And I thought, my God, this is what music is all about, tell a musical story. And yes, it's like, it's like there's lyrics to what you're going to play. Can I sing you something? Sure. With the lyrics? Go, go right ahead. Just at an exhibition. Here's how I play this tune. Put your stick down, don't conduct. <laughs> now, do you have lyrics? Do you have lyrics for the Haydn as well? <laughs> what a piece. I'll play it any time, day or night. It's very good. You achieved a reputation not just within the orchestral world, but also in the pop world. And here we have a clip of you playing with Doc Severinsen. Let's take a look at that. Oh. Doc Severinsen said of you, when you say Bud, you've said it all. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of my best friends, and I'm a great admirer of this guy as a player and as a really nice person. And, you know, uh, we did this piece several different times with the orchestra, and we did it on the, that special concert they had for my 50th year, you know. And at, you get to the end of the piece, and... Doc plays a cadenza, and I play the final cadenza, and then comes the last from out of a big chord, and you just jazz your way through that. So he plays his cadenza, and then I'm standing there kind of, well, what the heck am I going to play for my cadenza? So I played, da, 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 no. Shook my head. Play a little scriab and poem de Stasi. Da 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 da. Doc turns to me and goes Mahler five. Da 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 da. So right back at you, in other words. Perfect. Couldn't have been better. Early on, there something happened that threatened your career, and that was you had a really serious accident that messed up your mouth. It was very. It was a very icy street, and there used to be these trolley tracks. And everything was very icy, and I caught, got caught in one of those and hit a stopper of some kind. And I, I broke some teeth here and had 13 stitches in my lower chops. Well, by the time they fixed my teeth, the two dark ones in the middle are originals, the others are caps. And uh, by the time the lip healed and all that, I, so I missed a month of work and went back and played, and everything was there. But isn't that sort of like the most nightmare scenario for, no, a, for really. a trumpeter? I, no, I just figured, what the heck, I, when it gets healed up, I'll start practicing. Couldn't make it to Middle C for a while. Finally made it up to G on top of the staff. 
Finally got the high C. I said, okay, that's it. Back at it. Yeah. Tell me about the trumpet that you play. You play on a Bach C trumpet. It's a trumpet. Bach large bore C trumpet, yes. And yes. Uh, is, I mean, can, can a person pick up any trumpet and sound great, or does this trumpet have particular qualities? For example, I've heard that, that this particular trumpet is just a really good match between a brilliant player and a brilliant instrument. Well, it's kind of interesting because... I started my position with the Chicago Symphony on a Vincent Bach large bore C trumpet, which I had become familiar with because of one of my teachers in the Boston Symphony, Georges Magier, who was first trumpet there for many years. And uh, I liked his I liked his sound, and uh, so I played on that for several years. And then Fritz Reiner, he asked me one evening after a concert. I think we were in a hotel over in Detroit, Michigan, but I missed the it. Is that the best in B-flat that you're playing on? I said, no, it's a Vincent Bach large bore American C trumpet. Oh, he sounds very good. And Reiner was the conductor for it how was, many years? He oh, was well, let's see. He came in about uh, 53, fall of 53. And he was there for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Right. So well, he, anyway, he's he asking said, you about this trumpet. Yeah. And he said, I really like it. He says, and I have somebody who would like to buy some instruments for the orchestra. Maybe we get a whole set of four of them for all the players. The other guys were using similar horns already anyway. So I had Vincent Bach, who was an old friend of mine. Had this him. is the Vincent Bach, the, as yeah. in Bach Stradivarius, which is yeah. sort of the standard yeah, for, uh, right. for trumpets. So he made up about ten of those trumpets and sent he them out. He personally made these he, trumpets. Yeah. Well, in his factory, had, yeah. that was what he, I think he was still in New York, in, up in the Queens area, before he went to Mount Vernon. And uh, he sent out ten of them. And everybody just picked the one they wanted that fit their style and their feeling of sound and blah, blah, blah. And of course, we didn't use about everything. Sometimes you use a B-flat trumpet mm -hmm. for this and that. But it was the main one. And so Reiner liked them, and, and we got them. But that instrument, uh, does it have any special qualities in terms of its expressiveness, its flexibility? Yes, 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 it does. And the response for articulations is very, very nice. But, you know, getting into the late 60s, uh, I had gotten to meet some of the European orchestra players when that jet plane kind of started everything going around the world. And uh, the Berlin Philharmonic came, and we had a party together afterwards, and I got to play on rotary valve German trumpets. I thought, wow. As opposed to a piston valve yes, American exactly. trumpet. And we actually then acquired a couple. I think we were on tour out in California, and there was a dealer in L.A. that had was getting some of these. And... Uh, we, I tried them. I thought, oh, this is very good, especially for different repertoires. So we were the first orchestra in the United States to really start using, as a whole section, rotary valve German trumpets on certain repertoire. Because the, the rotary valve trumpets, what, it's a mellower sound? It's well, not it's, such a piercing, it, brilliant it, sound? Well, it can be very piercing if you, if you really lean on it. But it has different response to articulations. And of course, the... the um, uh, the pitch of various notes is a little bit different, so you've got to practice on them. Well, that's part of what practice is all about anyway, you know. And uh, so we went through, uh, oh, two or three different kinds until we came to one of the kind that we especially liked, both C trumpet and B flat for a lot of things, Bruckner, Brahms, Beethoven, all that, you know. And uh, we're still using them a lot. Some people would say that uh, that a golden age of the brass section was under Sir George Solsey. And let's take a look. Up, let's see a clip of uh, Sir George and the CSO brass section. I say in tempo at first, soft, soft, and here a little time. Back to tempo. Soft. I am not of course, this is a rehearsal for that famous yeah. Beethoven piece. Uh, as you, you've worked with so many conductors, and you yes. once said that a good conductor meets you 50-50. What do you mean by that? Well, and I think most of my colleagues would very much agree with me, especially those that have been around for a number of years and played under a nice variety of conductors. And the conductor gives the best he has, of course. That's what he's there for. But the orchestra is individual players and collectively also have to be prepared to give their best, too, and to be able to adjust. And the conductor then 
if he adjusts just enough to take the best that the band's got to offer, and the band adjusts just enough to fit in with what the conductor has to offer, that's when you get the best results. In other words, nobody should call all the shots on the podium or in the band. Favorite conductors that you had? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've played with so many very good conductors, you know. Um, I mean, Maestro Bram Wemmick, very, very gifted musician, uh, very interesting conductor. Maestro Schulte, of course, uh, special Fritz Reiner. I think overall, maybe my, one of my most favorites at least was Pierre Monteux, French conductor years ago. And what he, was it about him that, that well, you, he, you liked? Well, I, I, I tell you, he was very straightforward, efficient rehearsal guy. He did Russian repertoire as good as Russian conductors. He did German music as good as German conductors like Bruno Walter and Gotto Klimper. He did French music, of course, marvelously. He was a personal friend of Ravel and Debussy and all those cats. All he, those cats. <laughs> and, and he was... He, he was doing a lot of English music, of course, British music, and he was still learning contemporary scores, especially American music, when he passed away. Very interesting guy. You had a retirement celebration. Your retirement is from your emeritus position. There was a party for you, yep. and Maestro Baron Boim uh, said that you were a leader, a follower, and also a naysayer. Let's hear what he meant by that. And this I'm going to tell only you, don't tell him. <laughs> the remarks he used to make under his breath <laughs> about me <laughs> and about every conductor that has stood in front of this orchestra. Doesn't know about the music, doesn't know how to beat, doesn't know how to bring me in, doesn't know how to bring me out, he doesn't understand the piece and all that. And he always thought that we never heard that. Looks <laughs> so distinguished on you. And I like the fact I got a red ribbon here. Yeah. So it matches my complexion when I play. <laughs> Absolutely true. How are Congratulations. you? Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it's that. It's really been an honor. Thank you. you. Yeah, well, it's been an honor for me all the way too, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Hey, how are you? Hey, Bob. Congratulations, uh, bud. Thanks. Way to go. And thanks your words are well spoken. Thank, thank you. Well, here you are. Hey. Hi. Did you enjoy the concert and everything? Most, you know, what, I'll probably come almost every week to the concert. What the hell? Please. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So what the heck? Yeah. You know, you have, uh, you have played with some remarkable people yeah. at, at your side as oh, part yeah. of the ensemble. Oh, uh, God, yes. Uh, you're going to miss that, I bet. Very much so, no question. As I tell a lot of young people that I meet around the world where I'm doing master classes here and there now and that sort of thing, at the drop of a hat I'd start over, or I'll trade places with you and start over. That's how much I enjoyed it. Let's hear what one of your fellow musicians had to say about you, and this is your, your wingman, uh, John Hagstrom. He talked at your retirement celebration. Courage and sacrifice. The courage to go beyond the bare requirements of what is expected, even if it makes more work for your colleagues to be able to keep up with you, and even if it draws criticism from those who would rather spend their energy finding fault than working to join you in a commitment to something better. That takes courage, and perhaps the sacrifice of what might otherwise have been the much more comfortable working dynamics between people doing good work. But the world wants, expects, and needs the Chicago Symphony to be much better than good. The CSO is not a good orchestra. It is a great orchestra. And this is because of the courage and sacrifice of individuals like Adolf Herseth to be not just good, but to be great. That, for me, is what makes him legendary. As you think of your experiences with a great orchestra like the CSO, what went through your mind when you heard that? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, it was a somewhat emotional evening for me, obviously. And John Hagstrom, to put things like that, I mean, it, well, that's mainly what the focus is all about, you know? In any profession, I suppose. 
Uh, I thought over all those years that I played there, I didn't do any real faculty teaching because that takes a lot of your time. I stopped doing radio and TV commercials way back after having done one or two, usually Thursday afternoon after dress rehearsal. And I mean, being concert, a studio musician for... You know, and mm -hmm. just a couple hours in the afternoon then go play the concert. And I thought it, it got in the way of my own mental and physical preparation. So uh, I probably lost a million dollars in income over all those years by not doing that stuff, but it, I think it did help my career stay as good as I could keep it. And that's, to me, that was the most important. You could have been a soloist. You, you could have been like yeah, Maurice yeah. Andre, oh, yeah. uh, gone from city yeah. to city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yet you, just, you chose to stay as part of an ensemble, an outstanding one, but still you subsumed your own character in, an, in a greater ensemble. Why did you do that? Well, you know, I've been soloist ever since I was a kid in high school and then in college and in the Navy, where I was in band stateside and also out in the Philippines in World War II, both square band and dance band, you know. Square band, you mean orchestra? No, no, just regular concert band. Oh, concert band. Uh, you know, I, I was a okay. Navy, Navy guy. Oh. And uh, I got to go to uh, the Philippine Islands towards the end of World War II. And so I got to fight the Japanese with my trumpet instead of the rifle. <laughs> At any rate, uh, that kind of a background of solo playing. And then we had a Chicago Symphony Brass Quintet. We used to tour a lot back in the days when we had more time off between winter and summer seasons and so on. And I enjoyed that very much also. And uh, occasionally still have been involved with that a little bit. But there's nothing as musically satisfying to me as sitting in a world-class orchestra and playing world-class music. Beethoven Eroica, Mahler I, Bruckner Seven. Ravel Lavals, Debussy Lemaire, with people like the Chicago Symphony sitting all around you. To me, that's, the, that's what music is all about. Being a soloist, yeah, okay. Some people, that's their real talent, that's their ambition. Terrific. Same for them who want to be professors. Absolutely. Very necessary, very important. Chamber music players, fine. I remember young players when we used to tour with our quintet. We'd do an afternoon concert at some grade school, high school, and then an evening concert for the city community. And a lot of these young players would come up and say, well, is it okay if I go and play in a dance band? I said, absolutely. I mean, you've got to learn it, have the widest aspect of appreciation of music because it, no matter what you're going to end up doing, it helps. And now you get kids say, it's okay if I go to play in a rock band or a rap band? I said, of course. Just be sure you do your best all the time. Go prepared. But you, you, uh, you said that if you could start it all over again, you would. Uh, is there one musical moment, one moment that you had on stage that you would just really enjoy doing just one more time? I got too many of them. The list is that long. That's all I can tell you. Sometimes a, a similar type of question, people would ask you, well... What's your favorite piece of music? And very often I say, well, it's that thing we're doing on the second half of the program this week. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Bud Hurston, congratulations on Thank a you, remarkable Thank run you. at the CSO. Thank it's been so a pleasure. Much. Thank and you. It's been a pleasure for me to have another trumpet player interview me. Thank you so much, Phil. The honor was mine. And mine. Thanks. <laughs>